Well, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to welcome you to the Oscar von Miller Forum tonight, for uh, which I think is a highly interesting lecture on remote sensing. And a very warm welcome to our speaker, uh, Professor Jochen Teitzer from the Georgia Tech uh, or the Georgia Institute of Technology, which, which its full name is. A remote sensing and data visualization technologies which are rapidly transforming the way we design and build and operate facilities and infrastructure today. Access to reliable and fast data information and knowledge is becoming increasingly important in construction engineering and management. The lecture tonight highlights research being performed at Dr. Jochen Teitzer's RAPIDS and I think you will talk about that, that acronym quite a bit, RAPIDS Construction Safety and Technology Laboratory towards achieving safer and a more productive work environment. The lecture will also address the following important research questions. How can unsafe and unproductive work practices that are unknowingly designed or planned into the schedule of construction models be automatically identified early in the planning cycle and eliminated? Highly interesting and also very difficult question. What impact does real-time resource location tracking technology have on site layout planning and control? Can construction site data be collected and used to advance workforce, education and training? Methods and results to field trials will be shown. Future research and development will be discussed with the audience. So we will have a discussion afterwards and I think you should prepare also for some questions you might have. Presently, the research group concentrates on real-time proactive safety warning and alert technologies, equipment blind spot measurements, operator visibility tracking, Wireless 3D real-time resource location tracking, 4D building information modeling and processing, site layout management, and an in inference management framework with major focus on real-time proactive safety, health, and activity monitoring and sampling. Dr. Jochen Zeitzer is the director of the RAPIDS Laboratory, which is located in the School of Civil and Environmental Engineering at the Georgia Institute of Technology in Atlanta. And since 2012, he teaches as an associate professor there. Jochen Zeitzer received his PhD in Civil Architectural and Environmental Engineering at the University of Texas at Austin, which I'm really glad to hear. I've been working there for two and a half years as an associate professor and his Diploma Engineer in Civil Engineering at the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology in Germany, as we all know. You're really happy to have you here. Welcome to Munich once more, and we're looking forward to your lecture. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Lang. Um, I'm very honored to be here, um, invited by the Oscar von Miller, uh, Miller Forum, and also being able to stay here in this wonderful house. I must acknowledge that this is a wonderful contribution yeah, that you all can enjoy. And I wish that every university or any major city would have such an opportunity. It's something really fascinating. Um, my talk today is about remote sensing and data visualization. And I have quite a bit of slides to show, but most of them involve graphics that um, are quite easy to understand. So please um, um, pay attention as I move along. Some slides go pretty quick. Um, at my lab, I receive sponsorship from federal and um, state governments, um, not-for-profit organizations, um, including uh, CPWR and CRI, just to give you a background of how we acquire projects in terms of supporting our students. Universities, internal funding, obviously, and then a whole bunch of companies. Quite frankly, not all of those companies give me a lot of money, but give me a little bit or in-kind contributions, which is often important. Um, we have major sponsors from the oil and gas industry, as well as some leading um, construction contractors which make our research happen, and I'm very grateful to them. I want to appreciate them right now. So let me get started here with a couple of background slides to BIM and how we deliver projects now, uh, nowadays. This is the past, basically, where we had a lot of um, yeah, experts that participate in a project. A project that comes in and goes out, 
um, is not maybe in, in the most um, streamlined version. Um, this is what a project looks nowadays. It's pretty straightforward. We are on, but we need, try, need to try to be on budget, on time. And we don't consult experts individually, one after the other anymore. No, we work as teams where experts come in and basically jump in whenever they are needed. And that's really important to understand. Um, projects become much, much more collaborative, and this involves architects as well as engineers, uh, consultants, owners, whoever participates in projects. Um, this is a picture I took with some of our contractors we work with. Actually, we consulted them on a little bit uh, on safety and, and BIM. Um, but this is an integrated team. Basically, you bring experts in and you try to solve the issue all together. Um, there's a statement from a company in southern Germany or in Germany, Follack, and I think for you students that's maybe uh, a sentence you want to remember. We need leaders who challenge our organization, uh, that leaders or um, um, employees that are technical and communication experts, at least the engineers, they often lack a little bit on the communication side. So you, we have to work on that. Uh, at Geotech we try to improve it as, as good as we can. Um, they need to be flexible and efficient to react to changes. That's a big thing because changes happen quickly and they need to be resolved quickly. And leaders that take on responsibilities. So that's something that is not new to most of you, but this is what projects look like. So we have people in projects that are actually um, seeing very challenging um, issues. This is how projects were done in the past, at least with uh, transferring information. Um, basically step by step and it took a lot of time, but this is not what's happening anymore. We all know that the cloud is happening. Uh, virtual design and construction time, resource scheduling, estimation, um, project field management using technology, then it all comes together to a project. All of the data is shared online and we plan, we perform, and really what's in, of interest to the owners and contractors, how much risk do we actually take on before we deliver our project. So all what we basically do is risk management all of it, but a um, yeah, big portion of it. Um, these are available sensors and technologies or, that provide you with data and mobility as you can take them into the field. And I'm not going into those details to each one of those sensors, but you see here RTS stands for Robotic Total Station, Building Information Modeling. You already had a lot of lectures in the Oscar von Miller Forum where, where people introduced it. I'm not going through those details again, but nowadays sensors provide actually data or stream data into the field. In this case, a robotic total station that actually shows you exactly the point where you have to install material. And that data comes actually from the BIM model. Um, you know about laser scanning, photogrammetry. I don't go into those technologies. Um, they exist, they are heavily used in the industry now, at least in the United States, on many renovation projects, which become increasingly more prevalent in today's industry where we lack eventually capital to build new projects. There's automated reporting. A lot of companies focus on that, where data is basically collected and then made available. And there needs to be a lot of data mining algorithms that actually um, convert the data into information. And then once we have information, actually move it over to knowledge. Um, mobile data and information, smartphone, tablet, PCs. I have not seen a large project in the United States anymore where there is not a tablet PC in use as project managers go to the field, take pictures, look at drawings. Um, so this is really already new technology that is implemented. Um, I don't know exactly the state in, 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 in Germany, but um, yeah, I have not seen too many, uh, on at least the projects that I visit from while to while. Um, access to data on the web, everybody does that nowadays anyway already. Now you think about how do we compare um, with, uh, how, do we, how do we perform in terms of productivity? I bet you have seen this chart many, many times before. Uh, as manufacturing increases productivity and output, construction actually is lagging behind, actually decreasing slightly. It's fairly controversial, this chart, because you have to really think about um, what segments in the industry you look at. And um, of course, over here, elevators and um, uh, moves their manufacturers because they have more like a fabrication environment where they produce their products. Um, they have a much easier way to build them in an indoor facility. And that makes much different than a building contractor that goes out and assembles the material piece by piece. However, the situation is changing dramatically. And I'm stealing here a video from a, a great friend of mine, Mohamed, Mohamed Al Hussein at the Uni University of Alberta. He is a specialist in modularization. Um, and um, actually planning um, crane layout, site layout, etc. 
And this is a picture of seeing an apartment complex. I think it was for a university going up. And this was precise to plan so the crane can really swing. It has enough space available to put these modules that come on trailers, just arriving just on time and being erected. And this construction here took a few, few hours for, uh, I think maybe two days total, to build at least the, the, erect these modules. This is where construction is going. At the bottom right, you see an image from Skanska in New York City. Actually, this is a fabrication factory that they have in Brooklyn. Um, they have understood that um, modularization becomes more and more prevalent. It has actually, 20 years ago, been very, very, uh, yeah, people experimented with it, but the quali quality back then was not as good. But nowadays it's becoming more prevalent because the labor costs are expensive. Safety is a huge thing in the United States. Seriously, if you have an accident on a job, it costs you a lot of money. Um, despite the, the, the impacts on families or the injury to the worker. Um, but they have outsourced, or not outsourced, but located their fabrication of these modules to factories in Brooklyn. Then they ship the materials or the prefabricated materials to downtown Manhattan and erect it there. And in this case, you see here some um, um, bathrooms. And so what is the, the link between productivity and safety? Because I really want to talk about safety here. And uh, it's, it's a big issue to me. Um, quite frankly, I don't tell many people this story, but I was almost killed when I was a little kid going to kindergarten. My brother and I, we were hit by a drunk driver, and I think we barely survived. No, uh, frankly, we, we were just hit and fall down on the floor, but I think the, 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 the person that hit us was shamed afterwards and, and gave us a lot of candy, so we, we appreciated that one. Um, but but it comes back in my life where I say, maybe this was something that happened to me, now I'm doing all the work in safety. And I think it's a pretty good thing. Why is it a good thing? Well, think about it. In the United States, every workday, so just today, four to five workers got killed. Can you imagine that? Four to five workers got killed. Just let that sit for a second. Four to five workers every workday. We have about 100 to 900 fatalities in the U.S. Before the crisis came, we had about 1,200, which makes construction to one of the largest or war industries to work for in terms of safety-related issues. 25% um, of the fatalities actually relate to, tra uh, to equipment, um, and that's a big thing. So how does safety tie to productivity? Let me show you just this chart to make it simple. The better we perform in safety, so the less accidents we have, the more productivity we have on job sites. So one easy thing to believe in is housekeeping. If you have cables lying around on the floor or debris or, or trash, it really hurts your workers because they, first of all, can twist their ankles, but at the same time, they cannot walk fast enough from one part of the job site to another side. I come back to that later when I talk about New York City. And to that in New York City, the labor cost is about 30% more expensive than in any other city in the United States. And I'll explain that later. How is productivity and safety assessed today? You might wonder about, what, you might think about that. This is a graph that Diekmann did of a CI study. Uh, like this, I, it's on page 348, if I remember correctly. So very far back in this little report they wrote, uh, a big report they wrote. And you see here a st uh, sequence of steel erection where a student actually draw the lines of a worker walking around at height to act and put these steel girders together. It's absolutely fascinating. On the right, you see an image that we take uh, on, on field sites where we do our experiments. What, this, what the process of erecting or connecting these steel girders really should look like, if we apply the lean management and um, yeah, the lean management principles, which means reducing waste, improving safety, productivity. It should look like that. It's fascinating, isn't it? Of how much waste is going on there. The question is, how do you measure it? Well, I told you, students maybe watch with their eyes, and then they actually um, um, draw these things by hand in these graphs, and then they analyze afterwards. How can we improve this? Anyway, so this is kind of what it should be, but what it is in reality. And we see this all over the place in the United States or in, in construction. That's why people go away from putting these girders together on the site. They rather prefabricate and ship it to the site. An interesting statistic in the United States, um, the, the yellow curve that you see here is from the 
yeah, the accidents that have been reported. And I don't go into the details what the numbers mean, but basically the total recordable uh, is the total recordable incident rate. It's basically a factor that you take into account how many work hours you work based on the number of employees you have in, a, in, in your company over a year. And you see here that um, the general industry has uh, a total recordable incident number of 4.0. And this is obviously coming down from yeah, the, the 80s, from over 14. So we have seen already tremendous improvements. However, our goal is to achieve zero incidents, if you want to believe in that. What does the blue curve mean? The blue curve is these are companies that apply best practices. Best practices in safety, making basically sure that we are on track. And even those are at 0.43. And they're wondering, wow, hmm, we hovered around this 0.43 for such a long time. I mean, between 1 to 0.43. It seems like it's improving, but the, the big jumps have been done. Yeah? And they're wondering now, how can we get rid of this? How can we really achieve zero incidents? That's really the goal of everyone out there. Um, and you see statistics from CI that show you more details about what those fatalities that they have on job sites really look like and, and where they come from. And if you look at here, 26 in 2009 related to transportation. But I focus basically in my research on contacts with objects and equipment, basically people walking too close to equipment getting run over. Here are stories from, for example, Kosovo, where, where big uh, international color, um, contractors actually work and they employ a lot of earth moving contractors from the Kosovo. And um, they are not used to safety practices or the safety culture that we apply in the United States. And you see fatalities happening. I hear them maybe every other week I get an email saying, we had got somebody killed on our job site, can you not help us? And then we have falls. I said it maybe before, 33% of all the fatalities in construction relate to falls, peeping, falling down. So last night I went to um, the Raus Mincharatos, and the Christkindl market is going up. Watch out there how many people walk at height putting the lumber together, and if there's fall protection, they don't use it. And then look at outside today, uh, Oscar von Miller Forum, I think they replaced some windows or something else. They had a nice scissor lift where people were standing on top, skewered nicely. Um, you see differences wherever you walk around. All what you need to do is to open your eyes, an architecture professor at uh, Karlsruhe Institute of Technology told me once, open your eyes when you walk around, you will see so much and can change things. Anyway, this is the safety culture that we have employed currently in the United States or anywhere in the world, whoever believes in safety. You have a company basically um, really f um, um, embrace safety, but the CEO commits to it, really provides resources, provides worker training, gives the workers personal protective equipment like hard hats, safety vests, safety boots, um, safety goggles, right? Look around here in Germany on a job site. How many people really wear helmets? Yeah, it's, it's amazing of how many people don't do it, and I don't know why they don't get caught, um, literally caught. And, and safety goggles, even hand gloves. Yeah, on many projects in the United States, they are mandated. Anyway, my question is, while we know that our statistics have leveled, um, uh, the, the, the safety statistics, they have leveled out. Really, to make the next big jump, we need to do something that is new. And that's where I came in about 10 years ago. Maybe not just me, maybe many, many others too. But I said, look, we need to use technology. Yeah? Technology can help us in multiple ways. And I'll explain to you how we do that by explaining you the framework of my laboratory. And it's a very important slide. If you understand that one, you will understand all of the next slides. So. First of all, I leverage technology. I apply technology, we build our own technology. I'll show you some here, co-developed with companies. Um, first of all, we want to eliminate hazards up front. We want to make sure that those hazards don't appear on construction sites. That's very important because that's the easiest fix and the, the, the least expensive, I would almost say. So cost doesn't matter in safety. You want to invest in safety and you don't talk about cost investment in safety. Now you see designing for safety, what does that mean? We eliminate safety. They are building information modeling comes in. I explained to you how we use that. So the next thing is, well, we may not eliminate all of the accidents in construction, but if we think idealistically, eventually we can put sense out there 
um, that actually warn workers when they go into a hazardous situation. So I strongly feel like that is possible, that this is possible, um, maybe not everywhere, but at least to um, work sites where there is construction equipment around. When a worker gets too close, we want to give that worker an alert, and we want to record the event with a data logger, and that's how we reduce human error, because that's my third thrust in my research. We actually provide the information, we visualize it, make it simple for workers, because they often don't understand statistics, they understand visual data, visualized data, and we feed it back, we provide them with tools for education and training that improves then their, their, yeah, also, uh, yeah, their human factors, their, their, their skills. So that kind of prevention, real-time alerts, data collection, and visualization for education and training, these are the three main thrusts in my lab. And obviously they all tie back together, that's why I don't like these silos, um, they need to tie together. So that's why this is very important. From education, we can then go back and think about if we can provide an architect with some information saying, look, uh, it was very bad to put these lights up there because we hardly can reach them. And if we have to go there, we need to always use a scissor, scissor lift. So please design something differently that is more easily to maintain during the operation and maintenance phase. That's what we want to do. We want to ultimately improve everyone that is involved. It's really not about just the contractors, the owners. No, it's everybody who is involved in a project. These are examples from that's in the United States. You may think about this hole here, but really this hole is big enough so a wrench, a hammer, or a screwdriver can fall through and hurt someone below. You don't want that to happen. Why was it not covered with a piece of plywood? Because the subcontractor came on the job, did the job, drilled the hole, ran the pipe through, and simply disappeared. Didn't tell anyone. It's bad. Again, BIM can help us communicate where these holes are. And this is a serious thing because fatalities are low probability but high impact. But these, these issues like risk, um, um, having foot injuries, these are major. They can cost a, a, a company a lot of money. Same here with the wire. Um, in Germany, you are very familiar with the plywood that they put. Again, three pieces to make sure that nothing can roll into that hole, even on the ground. In the United States, it's also possible to put this wire up, even though it is not the safest solution. I have seen or heard cases where people actually fall through to the lower level and actually got killed. One of the guys actually had a heart attack before he fell through, so that was a different story. But you hear about a lot of sad stories if you, if you do work in safety, unfortunately. Um, oh, this is nice. How many of you are architects? Hands up. I have a good crowd here. Look at this. What do you have done differently in this situation? Think about operation and maintenance, not just construction. Every construction worker here has to tie, use these tie bags to safely work at the top of the building, at the roof. But hey, if the architect on this project would have made this wall slightly higher, but just a few inches or centimeters, just a little bit, building would have complied with all regulations that all of these tiebacks would not be necessary. Which means that safety has implications for all the way operation and maintenance phase. And think about all of the costs you can save not having workers later on telling, oh, bring your safety harness with you. A, and most likely anyone will forget them anyway, right? Um, before they do some maintenance uh, repair on, on, on the roof. So when we not come up with building models that actually tell us in advance, hey, if this is slightly higher, we actually prevent a big issue of falling to a lower level. This is a small thing, it seems like, but it's really not. This is how we evaluate safety. We have drawings. I have a question before I post them. How many holes, like I just have shown you, these little holes, maybe less than two centimeters, or, or no, sorry, less than five centimeters wide, how many holes do you see in this drawing? Who counts the quickest gets a big prize from me? How many do you see? How many can you count? Zero. Zero? Why? They're not planned. The plan. Shoot, I have to give you now a price. Okay. Well, okay. Well, yeah, you're right. They're not on the plan. Okay, you get a prize from me. See me later. Um, I have to email you the prize, maybe, or I'll send you a gift certificate or something. Anyway. <laughs> anyway, look at this. This is a drawing that was that was that a contractor uses to put fall protection up. Okay. At the, at the guardrail, yeah? Uh, this is a balcony, that you need guardrail here, and there's openings for windows. 
you need to put fall protection there. But it's really cumbersome because you have all of these regulations and forms to fill out and this safety engineer is already very busy actually crawling the jobs that are going out there and making sure that everything is comp in compliance. So how many of, I ask this quite honestly, um, how many architects do know all of the safety codes? All of the engineers, do you know all of the safety codes that exist? I tell you, nobody. Nobody knows them all or can apply them right away. And you're a safety engineer who are tremendously busy with a lot of issues. We have a big issue here. We cannot count it from a drawing like that because that's not even in the drawing. You're absolutely right with that. So that's where we come in. We think about safety not just during construction. Safety, as I mentioned before, involves yes, from general contractors, subcontractors, whatever they build on the job. But we need to think about front-end engineering and design where we eliminate those hazards during the design phase. We really need to involve the owner because the owner ultimately has to pay for it. And frankly, they often pay for it because they see the benefits from a safe job site, not the reputation. Because also just with a good safety record, fish eventually early because you, you know it, I talked about that. The productivity increases. Um, and we involve the architect engineers here also in the safety review because they have an important role because they bridge the gap not just for construction but also for the operation and maintenance phase. And you know that, that a building may cost you $20 million but in reality to operate it the next um, um, 30, 40 years, you will spend maybe another $100 million to keep everything in shape. So it's really important that you do front end engineering and design. The BIM model, I'm going now into this rule checker that we developed. This is a BIM model. How many holes do you count here? Can you count? How many How holes do you see in this slab? Time over, how many? Six. How many? One, two, three, four, five, six. Is it correct? I should have asked this question and given you a prize. No, it's not correct. There's a seventh hole right here. Did you see that little one? So it's nearly impossible to see all of those and find all of those. That's why we need to automate this process to find these hazards automatically in BIM. This is how significant it is. We have developed a process for that, I'm not going through everything, but we have rules that link to the model, like rules that um, the government mandates, and quite frankly, those rules are not sufficient enough. Many contractors have much more stringent rules that are much more detailed. But link them to the building information model that we assume is available. We link it then to the platform that is out there, like Tecla, Revit, etc. And we actually execute our rules on these platforms by, by the API we have developed that actually accesses some of these software packages. And we generate a report that provides a safety engineer with exactly the number of holes we have, where they are, and how they need to be protected. And then we go into the implementation. Ultimately, somebody has to implement all of this. Now, this work, here's a rule about fault protection in OSHA. OSHA is the Occupational Safety and Health Administration in the United States. It's kind of the bad guys who come out and give you fines if you don't comply. Yeah. It sometimes happens, but they, they are completely overworked. Yeah, they, they can't visit all of the sites, it's impossible. Um, here you see two inches or five, roughly five centimeter. If the hole is bigger than that, you actually need to apply a cover or a guardrail system. So we take these rules apart. We separate them into building objects and object attributes and prevent system. Actually, we build a table. And the table is, will be used by our computer and interprets then the building information model. So if you are less than five centimeters, according to OSHA, um, you don't need to do anything because it's small enough, but if you're between five centimeters and one meter at least dimension, um, then you have to apply a cover, so it's a relatively small hole. If you get bigger than that or a leading edge, then you actually have to apply a guardrail system around that hole. What does that look like? Here's the result. You have seen it before without. Now you see it with it. I show you the interface. This is the, or the original interface we had three years ago or three and a half years ago. It was super simple. You just clicked on this button, it automatically found those holes and applied all of these, these things to it. Wonderful, super easy. Everybody can do it. That's how it should be. Now, here's a cover just to highlight a bit the, the detail. Here is a guardrail, simplified, very simplified. People in the field don't really need to know the detail of where the posts need to go as long as they know where it has to be. 
Um, uh, and you see a hole, you see here a window opening that also has to be covered because walkers love to go to these windows and watch and uh, see what's going on outside and then they fall outside. Our, uh, not latest, it's actually already a year ago. My gosh, I'll show you some old slides. But anyway, this is an interface we also had. And you see here you can actually manipulate these uh, rules. If you're not happy with five centimeters, you can actually change it to 20 millimeters um, as you wish. These rules um, show the parameter that we search for. And then <clears throat> as you click on, the, uh, on this button here, actually all of those results come up. The nice thing is about you never want to take a human out of the loop. Um, for all, a lot of contractors would not like it, especially unions eventually, but you want to get the input. You want to involve them in the decision-making process. So what we do is we provide them with a, a prevention method. In this case, it's so small, you don't need to do anything. Here we give them the alternative to put a cover in there. The computer suggests that. However, if you, you want to put a guardrail system up or a safety net, you can overrule the computer, apply it, and then it would be visualized in the BIM model, and people can then print it or use actually not print it anymore, use a tablet, go in the field, and, f and, and install it there. Actually pre-assemble the safety material already on the ground, bring it to the location, and just plug it in. That's how it should be, in my opinion. Nice thing about it is we also um, integrate safety in the construction schedule. Has it been never done before? Um, we say when uh, safety equipment has to be installed, when it has to be uninstalled to make progress, and then we can actually simulate simulation, maybe more, I should more say um, 4D scheduling, where you actually show what a, the project is looking like. You see here green has been already built, blue is under construction, the red is uh, in one week, so you can easily communicate to a subcontractor, to the concrete subcontracting crew, um, what guardrail they have to put up. It sounds simple, you have to put guardrail systems up. Um, I, I found a, a magazine lying around not far away from the Oscar von Miller Forum where they showed the construction of a building. And um, actually, the, you clearly see that people did not use fall protection on that job. Yeah. Um, and that's how important it is. See here the difference from, from the previous one. Here they start building a wall, and to the next one you see actually they had to remove this and install the guardrail inside of the window. Again, this is the same. So we have done case studies in Finland, for example, with Skanska, uh, housing projects, um, and this is again showing what um, um, the fault protection or the guardrail systems look like. The interesting part, is not really finding just those, um, those safety issues. It's actually integrating all of that into the schedule. And you hear that actually um, from this part of the job to the next, you actually need to open the guardrail so people and crews can work from one to the, to the next phase. And that's really the, the essence. I think you need to include the schedule, the estimating the cost. Actually, here's the estimate. In the United States, we spend about to two percent of the total project budget on safety, a huge amount, a huge amount. It's good, but you think about how do they estimate? How do they procure safety equipment? Well, often they uh, like this, like that. Okay, and then it's either there or there is too much on a job site, or, or not at all. So here we provide them with accurate estimates of what they actually need. Like common sense that you should do for safety as well as you do for any other building product. Um, yeah, I'll show you quickly here a, the video, and this is just to, to sh this is my student, CJC is super smart, um, oil company really wants to have her as an employee, I'm not letting her go quite yet, but um, she's, she's really, really good. Okay, it's the, one of the latest interfaces where you do the checking, I may jump here a little bit um, just to make sure that um, you're getting bored, but you see here now already the Guardrails coming up step by step. This is how simple, how easy, how fast this safety rule checking works. Um, I think the next step is then showing the, if I'm wrong, the, the holes, slab holes, and you see little blue dots uh, appear. Later on, we zoom in and actually show you um, they look like. And again, you can still optimize some of those because there's a lot of small holes that are being covered around. Um, but um, you can put a larger plate on top of this here, for example. The next step would be then um, a quantity estimate. Again, this is how easy it is to generate this for this, for this building project. Um, 
you everything that you need for safety, at least to fall protection where we are focused so far. Um, save the results, get to someone. Um, I think the next then, um, the visualization of the schedule. Let me check here a little bit. Um, you see here the window openings are being checked. So now we check for all of the window openings. And step by step, they're being installed. Oh, it goes ra rather quickly. That's where we have applied guardrail systems. Now all of these windows have been in, uh, the guardrails have been installed in the windows. That's, these are the tools that people in the industry really need. Yeah, they want to have it quick and fast. And by the way, it shouldn't cost anything. Yeah, that's why I think this rule checker should be provided by the government for free. Why not? They have all the rules. Why can OSHA not provide it? Um, that's what we are working on. The problem we have is that we need buy-in and, and support from contractors, um, even from the building information modeling companies, uh, software companies, and it's hard. It's really difficult because it's maybe not on their priority to develop this product first before they do some other um, 4D scheduling. It's, un it's a little bit unfortunate, but um, that's why at university sometimes you can also build startup companies. So, hey, you guys are smart, right? You want to be an entrepreneur? This is your chance. Um, you should do the same with your research if you can. I'm sure, if we can do it, it takes a lot of time and effort, but the U.S. government supports that as well. You see here now the, the simulation again. You see these guardrails, they, they disappear um, as, you, as you see this progress. So anyway, I move here a bit faster. Safety detailing, again, as I mentioned before, some people are really interested in what the posts look like, how you set these anchors, but safety experts know that. They don't really need to know that. They are fine with a simplistic model like you see on the left-hand side. Oh, we did a nice study. Um, actually, a case study, I would call it. Um, uh, do you remember this building? Do you know where it's, where it's located? Of you know, in Munich, it's, can I say it's the ADAC Hochhaus? Yeah. And actually, we compared, and it's really interesting, the United States Occupational Safety and Health Regulations versus the German um, code. And it's amazing to me that in Germany, <laughs> they would put a cover up here. Um, maybe for practical reasons, somebody would overrule it and actually put a guardrail in place, or actually put all of those holes and assemble them together. But we see that there is differences, and that's important for contractors who work internationally. We have heard about Qatar and the, the, the issues that are there. And why are they there? Because maybe they don't have any safety standard, or very little. I think we can help them. Construction safety ontologies, what is that about? We actually try to link the modeling to activities on a job site because we think that um, safety is not just being modeled, but we actually want to connect it. And we develop here a um, rule, a language that actually allows you to understand, hey, this worker is at this height and actually needs a, a harness. Um, here, we built this brick wall and we need this bracing installed. And these are rules that we all know and these not, don't come from ocean. No, these come from um, work packages that are already defined. So why don't we take those actually embedded in our safety BIM rule checking? And you see here, we divide the activities and sub-activities, tasks, and then we know exactly the potential hazards because we've experienced that a lot of time. This is common knowledge. And then we apply it over here. Believe it or not, companies like Perry or any other form work um, um, contractor should be super interested in that because they could take this to their advantage, competitive advantage, to know exactly what platform do we need to use, how much space around our column actually needs to be free and empty, so people who actually work around these columns have enough space to erect it safely and productively. So this is exactly what we do here. We want to figure out how much is needed. Anyway, this is kind of job hazard analysis. It's a big thing in the United States. Every morning before workers start their work, they have toolbox meetings where they come together, huddle, and discuss about what are the potential hazards that every worker has to sign off and agree I was aware of those hazards. It's almost like a liability statement for them. But you can automate this actually give the um, superintendent who talks to the workers a little tool in their hands where they say, okay, today I'm working in this area, I work on this activity, I put columns, okay, I put um, the forms in the place, and then all of these potential hazards automatically pop up. And from there you see recommendations. Yeah? Now this exists already, but all done manually. And we automate this, we actually provide them even with visuals where we show and visualize to them how much space is required around columns. You may find it funny, but 
workspace um, occupation by another crew is, is happening quite frequently. And this causes delays and uh, people get aggra aggra aggravated about that. And um, that's something that has to be prevented. And here we actually have a preliminary work. It's really not finished. This is preliminary work. We have actually do workspace assignment. Uh, I told you already that CJ, my, my student, um, is highly sought after. And um, it comes from safety and design reviews. Um, this is a, a, I'll show you in a second why this is super important. Um, this is a, um, a, a ping system as it was built in, the, in, in, in reality. And guess what? Those two handles over here actually clash. So as you want to open one, it, it doesn't go all the way. It actually is blocked by the other handle. Can you imagine that? Uh, um, the valve doesn't close and suddenly you have some uh, whatever toxic or uh, explosive gas go through this pipe and you can't close it and it, it actually explodes. I mean, this is a big, big no-no. Um, um, you see here, even here, these handles are installed in the wrong way. Why? Most likely an engineer, we don't talk about architects here now, we talk about engineers, didn't see it, didn't, is it, yeah, sorry. Um, didn't see it and hey, they brought it into the field and it, it costs money. I'll show you in a second how much it costs to change a valve. You won't imagine a valve for, for a couple of hundred dollars, how much that costs. Up here, you see the, the, the wheel, yeah? The wheel was installed in a place where a worker doesn't have space. To, to turn the wheel. Or here, the wheel, there's a pipe. If you want to close that valve, you will hurt your knuckles. Yeah? It's simple, but it's, it hurts. That hurts, right, for a couple of days. Have you experienced that? I did. I worked in construction, didn't use my gloves, and yeah, well, it, it hurts. It hurts. Now, look at this. I like this. And I think CJ came up with that. She just comes back after the, after the summer working for them for three months and says, look, I did this. Isn't it fascinating? I said, wow, how did you do this? Well, I saw the plan that they had in place, and I thought we can improve this. Let's do it. Okay. Yeah. You see this here. This is the proper um, position of a valve. And quite frankly, this valve is here too high. And we all know this from ergonomics. Working at height is not a good thing. Well, you can walk for a few seconds. But if you walk, I think, more than 20 seconds above height, actually there's limitations to that. You need to stop work or put the arms back down so blood circulates through it, etc. Um, I'm not showing any of our ergonomics work, but we, we detected actually quite automatically of how much time people spend above, walking above their, their shoulders with their hands. Anyway, so here you see what should happen, what should not happen. You can find that automatically through safety rule checking. I'll show you here the cost of installing a valve. Somebody forgot a to install a valve, yeah, um, um, where the valve, uh, so yeah, something like this here. Anyway, um, the, 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 it's half an hour to actually mark it up, and uh, uh, that's forty dollars. And then we have to um, um, put a requisition in that costs us two hours, uh, one hundred sixty dollars. We are already at two hundred dollars. We need to sort out the location where we have to put the, the valve in because often it's not. There's already stuff in place, so that costs 160 we had $360. dollars um, We have to fill out a purchase order. We had 1340 We need an access platform because, yeah, it's high up there. That costs us $5,100. Now we have $6,520 for, for a $40. Uh, what is the valve cost? Oh, we don't, don't know it yet. And um, we need to get the material inspected and shipped. And uh, these barges that are out there, they cost a lot of money. So we are now at 7,150. I need to go to the next slide. It's really painful. Um, add extra platform lighting, yeah, because people need to see and operate it maybe at night. Cost another $960, wow. Um, and then, uh, yeah, we have to um, actually do the electrical installation because we need to link it to our control system, $10,370. Wow, it's done. Um, we just added another $900 valve. But the cost is about 10 times more to actually do it in the right place, order it, and install it. So you have to think about that when you start designing things that are not um, practical out there. Okay. Is this a good thing? We don't do this every day, isn't it? So yeah, you shouldn't do this all the day because you lose money for your company. That's why you need to recognize change, evaluate the change, and implement the change. The question is, what other technologies do we have available to actually do that? Oh, here she did also some oil platform stuff. I moved through this quicker. 
um, technologies do we have to be able to actually model more quickly? Here is laser scanning. Um, we actually thought about it. I was in the oil sands in Canada um, times already. People tell me always, and it's really a number that will shock you, but think about it. The labor cost is super expensive, especially in remote areas where labor is hard to come by, like in, in, in Fort McMurray where it's cold, etc. So those people earn a lot of money. You need to take that into account. Then the next thing is, uh, what are the predominant work tasks? And since they ship these um, prefabricated modules that go into the oil sands from Korea, dis disassemble them actually in Korea, ship them to California. In California, they get loaded on trucks. They drive them up to Edmonton. In Edmonton, they get put back together, if not shipped right away to Fort McMurray, and then get assembled back up there altogether. What is the predominant work task? Believe it or not, it's scaffolding. 60% of the direct labor cost in the oil sands is related to erecting and un, um, assembling scaffolding. I did not know. 60% yeah, how important it is. And there is no solution out there to automatically design scaffolds. And we believe that if you follow a point cloud approach, maybe measure the geometry of the object that you have out there, maybe even a BIM. There's a point cloud overlaid in Tecla structures. Um, and we actually start modeling automatically the scaffolding that should go in place. My student has done that for the buildings where they um, put actually scaffolding up around a building as the contractors needs it. Um, these are all colorful images, but there's a lot of, um, yeah, I would almost call uh, com com computing algorithms behind it to actually come up with a work phase and then put the OSHA approved scaffolding in place. But that's what we do here, just very quickly. Asset tracking in BIM. Um, I want to talk a little bit about our RFID. What you see here is a little um, rover that moves around. These points are all um, estimates of where the location of a pass passive RFID should be. Not sure if you're familiar with RFIDs, but passive RFIDs don't have batteries. And that's why they're very, very inexpensive. And the problem is, yeah, how do you apply them? How do you use them, for example, in building operation or building maintenance like here? And um, there's uh, Charlie Kemp and Matt, Matthew Reynolds. They have come up with an algorithm that is shown here um, that actually pinpoints the location. So my, my, one of my students has been taking this approach and actually developed it further to integrate it into BIM. And he can now locate, <coughs> first of all, RFID tags in a BIM model, that let's use those tags to actually locate the, per, the person's or the guard's position, as you see it here, inside of the BIM. And ultimately, we think that we can put this together and give it a safety inspector. A safety inspector goes along, moves along in a building or construction site and finds a hazard. He can pull up a safety record. And this interface here exists already. We have developed that three years ago. Um, you can pull up a safety record and actually make notations. Has been uh, in in inspected by Greg. There's maybe a uh, status is okay, but maybe something else is missing. So um, this is, I think, where the future of safety is going, using remote sensing technologies and data uh, visualization like BIM. Um, I talked about the workforce in, in, in New York City earlier. 30% um, um, more cost than in the other city in the United States. This is, these are pictures from San Francisco. We put little tags on workers, hard hats, and badges where we actually track their location inside of buildings. Um, this is another remote sensing technology where workforce has to comply with. They have to use it um, for their own yeah, benefit, you could almost say, because if there's an, a search and rescue or emergency, you need to evacuate the building immediately. You also know where the workers, go, um, where the workers are. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of uh, people issues in terms of, uh, yeah, especially recently with all of the things that happen here in Germany too with the Bundeskanzler line um, um, in terms of tracking. Um, these issues exist on construction sites too. Some workers are not happy about it. Um, but quite frankly, the reason why New York City percent more labor costs exists is most likely because of fraud, um, because some people sign in for multiple other um, people and um, um, overcharge basically money. Uh, the FBI and um, other lawyers are investigating that. Um, what we do is we basically track in a BIM where people's, people are. Um, for us, it's more like for work packaging, understanding of how far our projects along. And as people walk in there, they get actually registered, and we know exactly how much time they spend in a certain work area. Um, there's some fascinating results to see how many work, how much workforce is actually 
on the job in San Francisco, for example, there is a 25% minimum of local hires in that city. So you have to hire local workforce. That's good, in my opinion. What do you need to do? You actually have to use technology to track it because sign-in sheets by hand don't work. That's where this technology really comes in handy. So it really supports the local workforce. So as much as you think about technology hurting the privacy of a worker, when you come on my job site, I want that you leave healthy and happy my work site and you're employed on the next job. I know it's maybe idealistic, but, but um, um, I think a lot of contractors think that way. They want to be competitive. They don't want to run out of business. And I think the workforce in many cases thinks the same. As a matter of fact, we work with the, with the union iron workers in Atlanta for training purposes. And they like some of the technology because they learn from it. They know how well they perform and they can show the difference between union and non-union workforce. Any anyway, point clouds, or we go here to unmanned aerial vehicles. Another hot topic, people don't like it maybe. In the United States, as a matter of fact, we are not allowed to, to use it. And I may have to ask the people who have the video on to turn it off maybe in a second, um, because I show some things that we may not have collected. It was for research purposes, I think that's fine, but honestly, in the United States, you cannot operate unmanned aer aerial vehicles for commercial purposes, at least not for now, because the Federal Aviation Administration has not come up with a, a rule for that. In Germany, it's much more relaxed. And that's why I have worked there for quite a while now with a, a, a nice fellow, Sebastian Siebert. And uh, he has actually collected some of this data here. And you see here um, clouds that originate from all of the photos that you collect with a UAV. As it flies around, you actually collect photos. And these photos you can stitch together using comp computational algorithms that already exist, no research in there. Um, but the nice thing is this this photo is actually, in, in reality, a point cloud. Here you see the meshed surface. And this point cloud you can overlay with color points. And actually, we want to use these um, point clouds to actually find where safety hazards exist on a job site. That's really something we want to do automatically. Um, this job site we actually um, measured in Atlanta on our campus. That's why it was all on our campus, so it wasn't a big issue except that we did it the first time. I was really nervous that our UAV crashes into the, um, uh, the power crane, um, but we avoided that. You see here the level of detail that you actually can get. Um, look at this. How nice is this for safety analysis? You never get this viewpoint if you're a safety engineer. You see all the safety net. Again, this is remote sensing. All data becomes available, but how do you analyze the data? Well, it's done manually if you get the photo. In our case, we again try to come up with the algorithms that actually um, automatically analyze it. What do we do there? And this is not from a UAV, but this is a terrestrial laser scan using a laser scanner. That is, and uh, we, we scanned the, the excavation site here. One of my students did some very nice work just in his first year of his PhD. And quite frankly, not, not too advanced quite yet, but since he starts out, some very nice, promising work. Um, but he tells you exactly um, what is required by OSHA to figure out what is the height of the excavation. And if you reach a certain height level, you actually need to consult a professional engineer to, uh, to um, find the retaining wall. And that's exactly what he did here. As a matter of fact, he also has found the um, upper line of the excavation pit. And that's where CGS algorithm actually comes in and she will design our guardrail system around it. That's what we are completing right now. Um, and then you can think of it um, as the site progresses, you actually um, can do some automated safety modeling and updating. So um, that's uh, part of the reason why I'm here in Munich. Um, Professor Bohan does some, some extremely interesting work that I think a lot of people want to solve in the world. And this is just a project um, public. Um, but it's fascinating about what can be done when you think about how you take data from a construction site, analyze it, and actually link it to simulation models. Yeah? Absolutely fascinating. Just the, the, the opportunities that exist to almost predict, I may have delays on my job because the site geometry or the site um, is maybe not performing as it should be. I'm thinking here maybe for safety. Um, in the United States, somebody was interviewed by CNN at some point. They, they um, said, crime is not random, crime spreads. 
And I said, wait a second, if crime spreads, how does safety or safety hazards spread on construction sites? So I, I believe there must be a pattern involved in how sites are organized. And I, I strongly feel that once you do simulation, you may ultimately predict, hey, maybe in 10 days from now, there will be an accident because we have seen a lot of bad observations here that we automatically com collected with remote sensing data. I think uh, Professor Bormann and his students do some really good work there. Uh, I hope they advance as quickly as possible so I can use some of it. So anyway, um, oh, we do some other work. Um, this is a laser scan again from a construction site on our campus. Some algorithms that actually analyze the point cloud. Um, pretty simple algorithms, maybe. But again, these algorithms actually allow you to um, find out where the columns are pretty automatically. And what we do here is we actually try to find these columns, um, identify them as an object, and then actually do some um, ray tracing on it to actually identify where a tower crane operator cannot see the locations on a on, on, on a, on a work um, site level where the workers operate. You found that's too particular. It's maybe not needed. I t I'm telling you, if you all have gone through the traditional um, um education, um, all you learn there is you put the crane somewhere where it can reach the entire site, then make sure that you, it can carry the, the weight. And I think that's it, right? No safety consideration, no consideration, maybe consideration about productivity, of course, but not much more to it. Safety is completely left out unless you talk about the weight and the load of the crane. I think we need to take and take a fresh approach and look at um, actually uh, um, thinking about strategies like this one here. Blood is just one of them. There's much, much more that, that you can think of. All you need to do in research is be creative. The funny part, be creative and and start working, that's all. I mean, at least I'm creative, I think, sometimes. Oh, 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 we do something bad. We, we, we put tags on workers, little tags, RFID tags, in this case, ultra-wideband. It's a bit resource intensive because you have to put tripods up on a job site, and then you can, based on triangulation and time of arrival of the signal, actually find the position of the worker. And you see here, we have overlaid the worker's position for, this is just 15 minutes of trajectory data. So a lot of data, collecting a lot of data is a big issue and analyzing it in close to real time is really an issue. You will be overloaded with data that you can collect on construction sites. Um, anyway, this is the path of a worker. You see one time, two times, three times, almost a fourth time going through the blind spot. Obviously nothing happened, but um, uh, we did some measurements here too. Let me show you a video. This is from Leonard Bernold. Um, he's currently in Australia. Um, this is a doesn't have sound, it's not necessary. But, um, it shows you what's happening. A lift. Have you seen something already? What happened to this worker here? This, this load was directly above the worker. This is not, not allowed. This is completely, can I say the word, insane? It's unsafe, it's dangerous. This load drops. Down there, the worker is not injured, killed instantly. Think about a forklift, I think, drives now right underneath. How many workers? They're not even aware that this load is swinging. It's funny. It's not. I think in Germany there's a rule that you can actually do that. Somebody told me. I'm not sure if it's true. Do you know that? Can you give me feedback, maybe? Anyway, I would like to find out more. In the United States, that's not allowed. I actually have currently, or we will be putting up cameras on some tower cranes, and we develop algorithms that actually find how many times does this occur that works are below. It should be relatively simple because we hope that every worker wears a helmet that has a certain color value or a safety vest. At least we hope that they wear that. Um, and not that I'm saying that we want to have this working in real time to warn someone maybe at some point, but hey, just using this as an educational tool, taking the data, give to the workers the next morning and say, Joe, 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 we need to improve. And hey. Um, Harry, up in the tower crane, know oh, that you're swinging above other workers, right? So, again, what is a video camera? A trivial sensor. Yeah? You can put it up there, stream the data in real time, collect it and show it to the workers. You don't even need to process it. Everybody will understand. Yeah? This is about, uh, anyway. Uh, here we show again some tracking. I, uh, pretty complex setup. It was a coal power plant. We got access to 
And you see here a pit. Um, some of these areas were dangerous, like this slope here was too high. We were actually not allowed to go in. Those companies take it ex extremely serious, literally. And I'm not lying, on this job site, you cannot find a chewing, chewing gum on the ground. That's how clean this job site is. For example, if they have cables, they don't lay them on the ground. They put these posts up to run cables. So nobody will trip ever over a cable. That's how seriously those companies take safety. I want to see that on many jobs that I see in the, in the entire world. Now, what is happening here? Fascinating. This tower crane, ah, sorry, mobile crane in this case, unloads material from here to here and from here to here. Our goal was to figure out what are they doing? How do workers react as the crane starts swinging? Well, you see here multiple workers, they are tying rebar, they are hooked up, they are not moving. It's 15 minutes of data, they are just staying in their location working. But this worker seems to be in a spot where he should not be. And why? Because the crane is moving over here. Wait, one time over here, one time over here. Now what's happening when the crane moves over here? Well, the worker should do something, right? In the worst case, then it's, there, then it's a big violation. Now let's find out what has happened. Now think about um, airplanes, flight recorders, black boxes. That's exactly what we do here. What well, obviously yields because it's a good construction site. Those people have deployed practices. Yeah? You can easily see, we put tag on the crane, you can even see the crane swinging. Yeah? But you do this on a larger scale. And I'm not saying that all of the technologies out there that can actually do all of these things because sensor, for example, may not work well indoors. That's a, one of the biggest issues. But once you can do it, you can do fantastic things in research, productivity analysis. Do work packages get completed over time? Think about all of the lean management folks that have these big theories, but we are waiting for people to come up with good BIM technologies and other remote sensing so we finally can prove that their lean management approaches actually work. Yeah, otherwise, it's just theory, right? That's what we, what we try to do. Um, oh, here's a, you can measure the distance from the crane hook to the worker. Again, this, is, this position here is the distance from the worker to the crane hook. I hope this works here, yeah. See, the worker for a long time doesn't see, react at all. Doesn't even see it because the walls are high enough. At the point the worker sees, oh, something is coming, actually. Stepping outside of the way and coming back in to actually untie the load. And if you really want to... Uh, look like a, with a microscope to the construction site, you can even manage or measure how much time it takes the worker to unload, unhook the load. I would never do that, but hey, we just show it, it's possible. Fascinating, isn't it? Oh, here, BIM. We integrate BIM, the same job site I showed before. Now, this is data, and literally, this tool exists. We can stream this data in real time. So, if this job would be occurring right now in Atlanta, <clears throat> We could stream the location data of the rebar cage, the crane hook. Um, we have this 3D immersive tool where an operator can jump outside of the crane cabin, what pretty much happens right now. Operator did not get a good perspective because from here you don't see 3D as a crane operator. Crane operators at that such height, they don't see 3D. That's why the crane operator navigates out into this visualization interface. Oh, we have applied it deployed our rules here. Too close to the column, mm, not so good. And then you see the crane now moving slowly over there. There's a couple of workers. And by the way, this is a Google Maps in the background. This is kind of a lot of different data sets together. Um, and this is a true building model for that particular moment of the job site. And you see again, you see the crane operator moving around. And the crane operator either looks outside the window, down, or is this tool here now? The crane operator sees that there is actually the load above the worker, gets a real-time alert. The real-time data visualization, it works. We have tested it. Um, and then the crane is actually lowering the, the load. If, if I can, I may jump here a little bit. And you will see that the nice thing about it is that you can actually measure the performance. How do we measure the performance? We actually show you the trajectory of the tower crane as it is, has um, performed this lift. This is critical, maybe not on every day's job site, but if you think about path planning for critical lifts, like large structures um, that are heavy, you want to do that. Uh, most of the lifts in nuclear power plants that are being built in the world are reviewed because the hazards that are involved, and you can do this here, uh, get a trajectory. What we haven't visualized here are these hotspots where actually these safety issues occurred, but we actually can download a table which shows you exactly. And you see even here the worker's location. 
Again, think big here of what is possible once you use remote sensing like tracking technology, data visualization technology, and what you can do with data. Um, this is also a reason why I'm here in Munich, because I think we want to deploy some of that maybe on some job sites. Again, this is a video camera, $100 or 80 euros. Um, it costs data, but <clears throat> the data itself needs to be processed. And I'm not saying that we have algorithms available that work for everyday situation, but they have some promising results that actually analyze the data on a job site, just using the vision, vision data from a camera. And why do we do that? I mean, just look at the image. You see it yourself. It's not about to punish the operator. No, we want to have a successful project. As a matter of fact, this operator may have now um, his or her required um, break, break, which they have to take. That's OK. The excavator is doing supportive work. And you can actually measure that, right? You can even measure the articulation of the equipment. Some of the researchers have shown progress there as well. It's not just us. Not that I sound arrogant here. Um, um, but you see here what can be done. And I want to mention here Patricio Vela, um, uh, a colleague of mine at uh, Georgia Tech. He's in the electric computer engineering department. He has a student there. I have a student working on this topic. Um, it's, it's really nice what can be done. Um, you can now uh, um, put timestamps to it because we know the frame number. You know exactly how many trucks appeared on the job, when they left, how long it took them to load, how many loads it took the excavator actually to load a truck, etc. Um, eventually, we want to track also the workers um, here, um, but we are not there quite yet. Really fully understand it. A big thing in, in this is occlusion in vision based tracking. For example, if the trucks drive behind these machines, I've seen that this is a different algorithm that actually allows you now to track even behind those obstacles. And some, 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 yeah, we, 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 we start out on that. I mean, maybe we have spent two years already, but we're still kind of in the beginning. I have always feeling. Anyway, um, now we collect trajectory data. Um, I go maybe a bit quicker here, but um, you see here the uh, tracks. We put GPS tags on, p on machines like this one here. Uh, $80. Okay, it's not worth um, communicating in real time, but for research, maybe we don't need to show the entire supply chain of how to deplo deploy those GPS tags. But $80, you put it on trucks and vehicles. We put it actually on, on people. We georeferenced the job site. We had sidewalks where people were supposed to walk. This was all staged, by the way, not that you think we had a lot of these hazards. But as you see these vehicles go around and people cross the walk, uh, the, the travel pattern, you actually see a lot of uh, issues here with people being too close to equipment. Again, like I explained earlier, it's a major concern of us that people get run over or killed by machines. Now, what we do here is we can measure these instances and plot over time. And then from a control management or safety management perspective, you want to actually understand what risks are acceptable and what are not. And maybe your tolerance level is one every 10 minutes. But really, if you have a performance of a worker or a driver that is increasing as bad as it is here, like, oops, um, um, like you see here, nine proximity issues within a few minutes, then you really want to pull this guy off and give him or her a breathing and saying, slow down a little bit. Yeah. Um, in, in construction in the US, they're pretty harsh. You get a warning, if you don't comply, you're off the site. Um, after three days, you can come back. But if you have one more, you're kicked off forever um, on many jobs. Um, here's a um, um, research we do with proximity sensing. This is why I have this box up here. Um, I mentioned we want to use sensing actually to protect work from getting run over. And an interesting story, this picture I took in the Emirates. It's already three years ago. We only? Wow. Um, and the flagger that is walking back, so literally this guy is exposed. If, you, if I go into other countries and present this slide, they say always this guy is exposed because the driver is driving actually on the other side. So anyway, this is what we want to do. We want to put tags on people that protect them. The tag looks maybe like that yeah, and actually protects the workers. How does this work? First, we make blind spot measurements with, uh, for equipment. I think we have revolutionized there literally the ISO code who is really old fashioned, does is basically hand measurements almost. We have used laser scanning for that. You see here the blind spots just comparing two machines. Um, some equipment manufacturers have hired us to actually show that. Um, we have developed our own technology that I don't have here. 
but this is a smart hat where, again, we don't have batteries. Those have batteries. And then we have measured the blind spots here. And we really have used these tags and approached these vehicles. So literally, this box that I have here, unfortunately, I didn't bring the antenna. The antenna is quite heavy. But um, later in, in mid-December, I will come back. Uh, I will pick up from one from the company in Germany that provides that's electronic. Um, um, I will bring it back, and then I uh, give maybe a workshop uh, to all of you here in the Oscar von Miller Forum, and you can experiment. That's really neat. But this box goes on the equipment. There's another antenna that goes on the equipment. And as you walk close to the equipment, you actually get a warning. How does this work? There's basically several zones that you can set up here. In the, when you reach the yellow, you actually get a warning just for the worker on foot. If you step closer to the machine, you actually get a warning for operator as well. Why do we do that? Because you want to avoid nuisance alerts for operators. Let me show you this simply, otherwise you fall asleep. No, I'm kidding. Um, here's the machine driving towards this tag. The tag here is lying on the ground. We did extensive experiments in the oil fields in Bakersfield in California. That's why uh, owner is supporting us there. It's not raining. So you, you see, you hear this beeping, right? This beeping is actually on this little tag that you see here, uh, like this one, just a different form factor, and um, actually provides the walk on foot with, a, with, an, with an audio alert. At the same time, the operator gets an alert in the cabin. It's visualized, it's data locked, and uh, the walker then has to stop. If the walker doesn't stop and the uh, machine gets closer to the walker that is on foot, actually the machine will slow down if the machine gets extremely close, the machine will shut down. So it's really neat stuff. Uh, I must congratulate the company in Germany here that came up with that, I think, 30 years ago or so. Then it was used for a long, long time in coal mines. And we never got it above ground. I'm there to bring it above ground. That's really nice. And this is here the, the zones that you have here for the worker, here for the equipment. And our goal is zero, zero fatalities. We even take this for equipment. This is the equipment here in red. These are the blind spots to the equipment, and I don't know if any one of you is interested in transportation research, but um, this is the tag of a worker, whatever technology you would use, GPS on a worker, but we want to analyze actually what is the behavior or what are the travel patterns on job sites. And what you see here is kind of, this machine will now drive to the right. You will see all of these blind spots and the alert zone here, six meters and 12 meters visualized. If the worker steps into the blind spot, there will be a recording. If they step within this hazard zone, there will be a recording, which is close and in the blind spot will be the worst. We'll try to play this. You see the worker is now crossing the lane, unexpectedly kind of, and you see here now proximity. The worker is within the six meters, but not yet in the blind spot, but it's already bad enough. Now you see both, and the worker then gets out. Uh oh, I was too late. As the worker gets out, you actually get a, um, you get, you, you actually see now the trajectory. Now this, we take to it to our advantage and we actually put it into the um, in, into map on a job site and we can po pinpoint to you and tell you where these um, 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 has situations occurred. Maybe here's a, a, a spot where you need to think about transportation safety here maybe over here. All of this area seems to be fine. A safety engineer wouldn't need to take any further action. Oh, it's a bit higher and visualized. Again, this is a small say, data set. Some of it is actually staged because we didn't really want to harm a worker. But I think you get the idea of what is possible. Now, I've shown a lot of things. And this is a wheel. Actually, I stole this idea from Autodesk. But um, this wheel is kind of showing, I think, where some research is possible that can be extremely uh, kind of low-hanging fruit and um, things that you can easily, easily accomplish. Um, um, I think that's where a lot of focus may happen in the, in the, in the next couple of years. <clears throat> um, I think this is what I wanted to show kind of in terms of sensing technologies out there in terms of um, um, tracking people. Real, um, even vision sensors, but then also what we did early on with the prevention through design, all of those three thrusts that I showed, putting the hazards in the first place, but then we send out people, protect them in real time, and finally collect the data and trying to visualize, trying to interpret it, and actually 
providing workers with feedback because they value this. It's important to get workers involved and not just to blame them, saying, yeah, this was stupid, why did you do that? And so it's, I always think about empowering the workforce, not punishing the workforce. We want to create impact, I think we have that. I think Chuck Eastman explained here, uh, maybe a year or two years ago, that's him. The funny part is, and I really like him, he's actually getting older. Um, I think that because he has so much energy and um, it's a, lot, a wonderful journey to work with him on some of the BIM and safety work. Um, all of these figures, by the way, are from my research, but he, 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 he's, he's, the, he's the big guy. We all can be big guys, this is our dream. Um, I don't want to forget my students. It's extremely intense to do field experiments. It's often overlooked. Often people just think about algorithms development and not going out in the field. My students earn a lot of credit, all of them. And yeah, this is me sitting here. Yeah, this is my teaching philosophy. Not sitting, I'm, I'm, I'm on construction sites, you never sit, that's forbidden, because um, you're not productive. Um, but really who matters here are all those that are not already are having a job, and it's those, those kids, uh, those students. It's, um, the key part, in my opinion, is that industry needs to be aware of. The world is changing. They have realized that they are investing a lot of money in research. Unfortunately, a lot of in-house. And I think industry needs to step outside of the boundary and say, who actually will work with us in the long run? It will be the students at universities, applied science schools, whatever. And I think if we don't support the universities, also from a company standpoint, I know in, in, in the United States it's a bit easier, but I know in, in, in Europe it's really hard to find a company who gives, who writes a check about 100,000 euros. It's really difficult. And I think that model needs to change because it's really, how do I say that? It's really um, lucrative to actually support a student during the education, hire that student afterwards, and having that student already trained with all the tools that are coming up. Um, I think industry needs to learn that, especially maybe in Germany, um, but, but that's just a recommendation. So if you hear that on video later on, please support universities. That's all, thank you. Thank you very much for a highly interesting, um, scaring on the one hand, but also enlightening uh, lecture. I would like to open up uh, the audience to questions uh, and for a discussion. It can be questions and answers, but it could be also an open discussion. So are there any, any first impulses from your side? Did you find it as, as scary as I did, or, or are you more comfortable with being on a building site now? So where are the first questions? Maybe I asked the first one. So, uh, I mean, I've, I've opened already somehow uh, the thoughts and the, and the kind of reactions I had. At first, and on the one hand, I felt like, oh gosh, this is this is so complicated now to be in a building sky, site, so dangerous, you know. Um, that on the one hand, I say yes, it's absolutely necessary, and you made it really clear, and and, and also in your energetic mm -hmm. way, you believe in it, and I think it's important. On the other hand, it sounds it, to me, it sounds complicated, it sounds to like as if it would be holding up the construction process, and I'm sure it's not. So how can we integrate the safety measures and all these strategies in a smooth way, and I think this is what you want to get at in the mm -hmm. end, in a smooth way, so that it's, an, it's an, just an integrated thing where you even don't have to think about it anymore, because you get, you get the kind of um, input, you get the information to, to integrate it. Is, is that the way we go? Because you still have to be alert, you still have to be thinking. You mm -hmm. know, I'm not saying that you leave your brains at home and you just rely to computer sensing and to, to signals get, uh, but I think it has to be, to be done in such a way that it becomes an integrated part of the, the work process as such. How, how do you manage to achieve that? Uh, I agree with you. It's, it's very important to make sure that you it's all of the goals and um, be productive, quite frankly, on, on job sites. Um, I, I think it takes a multi-level approach. One is, how do you make workers believe in it? I, I, I should correct myself. You cannot make someone believe in it. You need to explain to them and convince them. 
so they embrace it, and it takes a lot of time to do that. We had projects where uh, it's easy to take these tags off of helmets, super easy. Yeah, you just give it to a friend. Well, then you think about, okay, how do we do it? We have to integrate it in the hard hat. So construction workers are extremely smart, but um, you have to work with them. And quite frankly, there are a lot of job sites where these technologies are being used now. And in the beginning, there's a little bit of resistance, but soon afterwards, people comply with it. Um, the management level, I think it takes a little bit of longer term. And the reason is that people are used to the way that they construct and they don't stand yet the advantages, meaning that the data is not coming s seamless. It's kind of taking a lot of effort to actually produce data, and so far we have struggled with that too, to integrate it into the processes. So one part is actually mapping the entire process, like a lot of people do, for example, for um, steel structures, for precast um, concrete, and figuring out who needs which piece of information. Then you can achieve what you explained in making it possible that information flows easily from whoever needs it. And then once you have the information and you apply it, it may at some point become knowledge and um, it becomes a common day practice. But it's, it's a long journey and yeah, I think that's what research is about. You may not have the solution right away, but you have to find the path towards it. Mm -hmm. So there's a, there's a side question to it. Um, do you find it difficult to convince construction companies to integrate that on the site? And I think in the end it also needs more training with regard to the workforce beforehand to use these tools to be aware of the benefits are. So, so how, are you, how are you pushing this process? I mean, you have shown yeah. a lot of sponsors and I think those are the ones who are probably interested in that. Do you find a certain openness there of the people understand it quickly? Yeah. Uh, and how are you going to implement that? What yeah, is, it's, the next level? Yeah, it's a really nice uh, question. And the, uh, the answer to that is the market out there is right, rather competitive. Um, and companies look for these technology gadgets nowadays. Oh, tablet, PC, how do we use it, implement it, etc. And I think that's where companies like to have these little case studies. They see, does it work? Does it not work? And then it doesn't have to be perfect in the beginning, but if they see that there is potential, they actually want it. They want to have it further developed. In the United States, at least, you need openness on that end because they see that there is the potential. And as a researcher, you don't have to be right there with the solution, no. But you have to show promising results. So that's where we work with the oil and gas industry. They like this proximity sensing device. And as a matter of fact, we work with the owners. We don't work with the contractors who actually should use it. But the owners have interest making their sites more safely. So you see, a big area of where people actually want to improve. It, it comes from all sides, basically. And just the sheer competitiveness among some of the top contractors is, is going into these technology domains. It's, it's really nice to see for us researchers, at least in the US. And the challenge is that, yeah, those who don't, they lag behind. And, and those who invest early may have to Pay, uh, yeah, pay, pay a lot of money to get it actually done. So a lot of companies actually tell us, ah, we don't want to be the first ones. Let someone else um, burn feet first and then we use it later on. Um, though, yeah, it's an interesting like question. We'll go back to the audience, but I still have another question. Um, if you, I mean, are you, I guess you're able to compare the situation in the United States versus, um, versus Germany in a way. Uh, and I'm asking that question on behalf of the students because they, they of course have been on building sites, I guess most of them have, have been, and so they can relate to that situation. Mm -hmm. Do you think we are more loose in a way? We are not so much aware of, of the issues you have faced there um, and, and we should change our attitude or would you, would you say actually there, there's more awareness here and this is why it might take longer to introduce uh, tools like that? I'm for sure. Uh, and convinced that the legal system is very different in the United mm -hmm. States. So the danger of actually losing a lot of money through an ex uh, incident you, you, one of your workers might have might actually be the end of your company. You know, it could uh, as well be, if yeah. If you're heavily fined and all that. Uh, and I think it's probably different with regard to that. I mean, the workers are protected clearly in Germany as well. But, but what about the awareness and what about the necessity to introduce things like that in, in Europe or in Germany also? 
I think it's all about safety culture. I mean, maybe I back off of technology a little bit. I think the most important thing is to implement the safety culture within a company, making sure that this is in place. And once you have achieved all of those goals, and that's where the safety statistic, there's one graph I showed, it will help, it will drive you down close to zero. But those who need to go to the next level, I think they have to go for technology. Yes, legal issues are a big thing, and I completely agree with you. There's different levels maybe in the United States, lots of more lawyers maybe in the US. The compensation system for somebody who gets injured is completely different. I've heard cases here in Germany where I said, subcontract had an injury, but one of their workers, yeah, well, I mean, it's not my issue, basically, insurance will take care of it. So I think, yeah, things have to be improved. I mean, I, I see some German job sites which I'm amazed about, people wearing just shorts and steel-toed shoes, shoes and nothing else, uh, at least during the summertime. I'm amazed about that this works. Um, and I, uh, as, as, uh, when I walk by job sites and I see like that, I, I let this guy come to me and I will tell him what, what's happening. I do that, I don't care. Sometimes people yell back to me, but anyway, um, yeah. Do, do, you, do you have any uh, comparative number of casualties on, on, on average? In, uh, Europe, on, a, on European or German buildings versus the United States? Yeah, the statistics in Germany versus United States, they're pretty much similar. The or Switzerland, for example, typically construction is responsible for about 25% of all of the fatalities, of all workplace fatalities. So we are really uh, contributing to a big number of the fatalities. In Germany, the overall number of fatalities is lower than the United States, but at the same time, the construction volume is not as high. Um, I assume that reporting, this is another part, who's reporting what data? In Germany, the reporting, of course, of fatalities is very similar, you have to report it, but then when you go into lost time accidents, um, there's um, yeah, kind of specific differences. Um, and this makes it very hard to, to actually compare. So that's another area that needs improvement, in my opinion. I'm not saying that Germany is really bad. No, I'm saying that, but I think we can always go to the next level and to achieve zero. Mm -hmm. So, so we raising, need raising the awareness is, yeah, is one of the first tasks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I give up now, so finally it's your it's your chance to ask questions. Are there any questions out there? Yes. Um, could you take the mic because otherwise the people could not hear you in the back? Just the microphone. Yeah. Yeah, um, I'm from Atlanta and from where? Atlanta. Atlanta. Yeah. Great. Yes. And uh, my question is there's a more influx to the city for our generation, for the 18 to 30 year old age gap. And my question is, can you apply this technology to other urban infrastructure projects, like bridges, tunnels, uh, urban what, transit? Which technology do you? Like remote sensing, making job sites safer. Because what you showed was probably buildings. Yeah. Can you apply it to a bridge, for example, for a new, a new road? Could you apply it to? report one way when they were constructing that. Yeah, bridges, for example, if you talk about the building information modeling and safety rule checker we have developed, you work at bridge heights, uh, you can apply that to anything that deals with concrete or openings, you can apply to the, those projects as well. We haven't worked there yet because, yeah, most of our contractors that approach us really want to do something with buildings. But infrastructure projects are important, especially those devices. I would say that for building sites, they might be okay, but maybe the big application area is infrastructure, mine, mines, open cast mines, where people really get run over by equipment. Or work zones, like uh, if you're in Atlanta, the connector, if you work in that area, you have cars driving by all the time. It would be nice to actually have a camera, see these vehicles coming on and actually give you a warning, um, not just the construction equipment. So, connector is an interstate, it's just very busy, so, yeah. Thank you. Another question back uh, you. My question is, uh, in case you were uh, very much concerned about the safety and also the, uh, to, to make a big step toward, uh, I mean, decreasing that numbers, which are totally somehow constant, what is your opinion about the future for automated construction as if uh, can be uh, 
the same need for workers or maybe human workers on site and also it would be uh, simplified tasks or, or automated tasks, machines simply doing the uh, workers' tasks. Thank you. Yeah, um, well, I would say that maybe a little bit history, at least what I heard, um, in the 90s, a lot of companies, big companies, invested in robotics, and back in the days, it really failed. So they really lost a lot of money, because there was already done a lot of research, especially in Japan, but also in the United States. So robotics is coming back because the computational power has increased. It's becoming also more um, um, relevant, especially in these situations where I talked earlier about prefabrication of these modules. Um, yes, you may replace some workers, but I think a lot of the work still needs handcrafted assembly, especially in these factories, which might be unique for a long, long time. So I'm not, I don't think that rob robots will replace everything. Yeah, but the industry is going towards more industrialization or, um, of, of the construction environment. I would almost say, somebody made this comment just recently, construction is many, may, maybe one of the remaining industries where we haven't really um, um, applied all of these lean principles like they have been applied in car in, in the car manufacturing industry, etc. Um, so yeah, it's maybe up to us to think about good solutions there. Um, and, but yes, there will be big change coming. Um, the UK government, for example, um, has very aggressive goals. That's why I think they are very good in BIM implementation. Um, people compare typically Finland. Um, as, as one of the um, countries that applies a lot of BIM, but the United Kingdom is really, England area, is, is really pushing forward. United States, Germany, because of its regulations, I think, has, has issues. However, these regulations, I think, are so strict and well formulated that they eventually may help getting BIM better implemented in job sites. So, and yeah, as companies progress, the industry will change. Yeah, uh, I, w I really like the idea to make uh, to put the RFID system into the security. And I would like to ask uh, if we have any physical limitations in the system. Uh, any what? Uh, I mean, in your RFID system, you, you use the radio frequency, right? Any limitations for the system? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, any technology has tremendous limitations. Uh, RFID by itself, if you talk about active RFID, it has batteries. Passive RFID has short range. I mean, yeah, that's why it's sometimes very hard for companies actually to commit to one of those technologies because they're not convinced of the investment benefit that they actually um, receive um, because it fits for this application but not for anything else. Then they have to buy a sensor that costs a lot of money but really it's just there for this particular purpose. So in construction, it's simple. It needs to be low cost. Easy to implement and what else? Easy to use. So. There's room to, for improvement. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Okay, so we take this one more question. Uh, my question is from one of your initial slides. Uh, there was written that this system could, can be used to uh, increase the productivity by generating automatic reports. My question is, can we uh, have real-time calculations how much work has been done on site so that we can get an automatic uh, report regarding the, quant calculate the quantities and uh, so the engineer can uh, clear the report for its, his payment of the contractor? And how, if yes, then how much it is reliable? Do we need to go again to the site and check it physically? This system is in... Yeah, there is, so there's a lot of researchers who work on automated progress monitoring of construction sites, uh, for example, vision-based systems. They do some very good initial work. I think in this area, it's by far not solved, in my opinion. But it will go in that direction where you will have technology where you can simply see the progress automatically tracked on a construction site. And I, I believe in this. I mean, knowing Professor Bormann's work there a little bit with simulation, um, I think this will play a major role. I think the, the issue with simulation, I'm not a simulation expert, but I think the, the problem was always 
they have real data available that they can actually feed into the simulation for construction. I think for a long, long time that was a big obstacle, but I think it's becoming available now. That simulation will have big success and a big impact. And then you tie that to progress monitoring, actually predicting your work progress. And you have these other tools that or algorithms or whatever technology the other researchers develop and uh, our companies. Because uh, because uh, in many construction sites there are a number of, it might be hundreds or thousands of activities going on. So sometimes it's very difficult to point out the, which activity has been completed or not. And then some, uh, you, you know, we cannot uh, judge, uh, we cannot make the real time progress reports and the uh, uh, in the payment certificates to the contractors. So. Can we rule out so much project coordinators, planning engineers, scheduling engineers, there are a lot of stuff equivalent to the people physically doing work? So how about you would come up with a system? You specifically, you take an iPad or other technology, a tablet, and you point it there, you take a picture, and based on this picture, you actually say exactly what has been installed before you cover up the wall with electric circuits, etc. I think you can do it. It should, should not be a problem, right? Just documenting. People do it anyway because they want to be protected before they cover up the wall saying, hey, I have installed these things inside of the wall. And then once you have this progressing uh, uh, re reporting, you can use it for all of the management. So I, I mean, uh, it will be available. I think 15, 20 years from now, you will see everybody walking around with, 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 with tablet PCs or maybe even cameras embedded in the helmet or Google Glass, whatever you call it. And people will monitor things automatically. The question is who will do it? And maybe a little bit of insight. Um, companies like Microsoft, um, Google, they really haven't tapped into the construction market. Or, I mean, SAP has. Um, but I think there will be a big push because it's funny, construction is about 8%, maybe more, 10% of the global GDP, gross domestic product. And, and I think it's... The companies who invest so much in information technology have not focused yet on, on um, the construction industry. I, I can't believe it, why they tap, leave out this market. So you will see at some point somebody big coming in and um, making things very quickly possible. Thank you very much. Uh, we will have, um, should we have this one last question? Yes? Okay, one, one last. Hello. Uh, my question is that since we are talking about safety, uh, this topic is not really uh, like into in third world countries. Uh, like people are not really aware of uh, safety in con construction sites or any other uh, production environment. So how can we address uh, this new technology in these uh, countries where it's not really practiced? You don't have to go far. I'm not comparing Bavaria to third world, or my my home state Baden or Baden-Württemberg. Um, you can start right here. You don't have to go far away. There's a lot of issues we have here. I agree with you that going abroad, especially in those areas, visualization of data is super critical because people may not be literate enough. That is, by the way, another big factor. Sometime uh, Saudi Aramco from, yeah, from, from the Middle East called me and said, we need something that people can use, but something where they don't have to understand and read. And I asked, why? Well, they said they can't read. Uh, wow. And how many people are you talking about? Oh, with 6,000 workers, right? It's amazing of how these mega projects are be, that are being built out there are being performed. I'm not talking about any social conditions, but, but just the workforce itself. So you, you deal with major issues. So again, easy to use, that should not cost anything. And what was the third one? Books. And reliable. So. Well, and we should not forget yeah. that these people probably use cell phones also, although they can't read. So yeah, but an issue read. for them was yeah. having these, for example, proximity devices and having a worker, these 6,000 people actually go back at the end of the day and charge them the batteries was a big nightmare to them because people would not do it. Mm -hmm. So coming up with a battery-free device was really important to them, but yeah. anyway. There will be the chance for maybe asking more individual questions. There is some drinks waiting there for us, especially for you, you deserve them most of all. I thank you once more for a fantastic lecture and thank you for being here. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.